Your other, your other left, Marty. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Fabian, Mr. Adams, and Mr. Knox. Hold colors, please. You're on your own. Okay, we're ready. Before we get started here, um, <coughs> if anybody in here knows of any of these bricks in here, of any veterans that should have a silver button on them, and you know why that is, uh, please let Walt or somebody know, or Jeff Christ, or Walt. Okay? Music, maestro. Yes.
Got a tough crowd this year. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know, Mr. Cameron Conley, the teenager on the violin who loves to accompany our... <laughs> He loves to accompany our magical musicians in Carefree Country Club. His grandparents live here on 7th Street. <clears throat> Who knows what's next? <laughs> Miss, Mr. McClugan, post the service branch colors. point out that Jeff Christ spent his time in the United States Navy 
to my knowledge, we have no Coast Guard veterans in here. Are there? Fall out. Got water this year. Now I'd like to introduce the first of our two guest speakers, uh, Mr. Tommy Eflin, a retiree from the United States Navy, who I had the pleasure of serving two and a half years with. people, and especially all of you veterans. I'm not exactly a Navy retiree. I spent my time in the Navy from 66 to 70, and like Lauren said, even though I knew him as Tony back then, that we spent quite a few years together in Yokosuka, Japan. I grew up in a little town uh, up in the top of South Carolina, probably tell that by my accent. There were 30 kids in my class. We went to a consolidated high school where we graduated 90 in our class, three, of, three towns. During high school, well after high school, I joined the United States Navy. But I graduated in the class of 1965, and I believe 1965 was the hardest hit class in both colleges and universities and high schools during the Vietnam War. The little town I grew up in was so small, it was about 3,000 people total, that if you did anything downtown, your parents probably heard about it before you got home. That little town today is Clemson University. Go Tigers. <laughs> uh, growing up, I grew up with all the way through school and through high school and graduated with a good friend named Barry Alexander. Barry and I were in Boy Scouts together. We were played football together. We did most of the things that youngsters will do all the way through high school. I don't think we ever double dated. That was about the only thing we didn't do. Being from a little town like Clemson, where everybody was dependent on their parents for, uh, or all of their parents were dependent on the university or college at that time for their living, when we finished high school in 1965, both Barry and I uh, were headed off to college. My parents thought it was a small college that would be best for me and I think Barry went to Clemson. After about a year of college I'd had enough of that one to see the world hence the Navy. Barry stuck it out for about another year and I guess to avoid the draft joined the uh, Army. I'm not sure how you avoid the draft by joining the Army <laughs> during Vietnam but in any case uh, he went to helicopter school. He became a warrant officer and evidently a good helicopter pilot because by the time he finished uh, helicopter school, he was assigned to Vietnam, uh, and that would have been in 1968. And he was the chief pilot of a Huey. Now, I don't know how it worked for sure in the Army, but I assume the chief pilot or the command pilot was the better of the pilots through their schooling and training. Uh, I, meantime, was stationed in Japan, Yokosuka, on a little island that we called Bakashima. Its real name was Azuma. Everybody called it Crazy Island or Fool's Island because we kept nothing but about a million pounds of explosives on it. And in Japanese, Baka means crazy, 
and Shema means island, so Baka Shema was the way we were known. In any case, in the various buildings that we had behind one of them, the Mark 27 shop, which was an underwater weapon, uh, we had what in the Navy we called a smoke shack. I didn't smoke, I really never did smoke, but everybody went to the smoke shack for a break, you know, if you could see through the smog. And that was just our social get-together of the day. Uh, I have a habit that I've had to this day of reading the more or less obituaries. At that time, it was a list of those that were killed in action in Vietnam. came in the Stars and Stripes, a newspaper that most of you veterans are probably familiar with. Uh, I read it every day, and much to my shock, Barry's name showed up in September of 69, some three months before I was due to get out. Uh, that obviously hit me very hard, but I didn't know much about it. We didn't, we didn't have the kind of communications that we have today. So some three months later when I got home, one of the first things I did was ask some of my friends what happened. Uh, one of them showed me the newspaper clipping where Barry had the Bronze Star and, and 22 aviation medals, well, clusters on his aviation medal, 22 times. I'm not really sure in the Army flight what aviation medals are, but I assume they're like air medals that were issued to pilots who one of their missions turned into actual combat mission. He had 22 of them, Purple Heart and a number of other things. Uh, the story was, and I'm not really able to verify this, uh, but I've been trying for the last few days. There's a lot about him uh, on the internet now. But when you look up the actual uh, military records, it's a very formalized military account. Uh, commander uh, of aircraft, aircraft lost at some place and some place belonging to certain detachments. You know, it, it just follows through the date. Uh, evidently, everybody on board was let, was lost. However, the story that my friends told me back then and is registered to this day was that Barry had gone through flight school with uh, a friend or a fellow that had become his best friend, been assigned to the same uh, military uh, detachment, sent to Vietnam at the same time, and they were good friends over there. And they had talked for about the year that they their assignment was in Vietnam about when they got out and they were going to tour Asia and just have fun for 30 days before they reported back to the U.S., and this friend was evidently two missions short or a few days short, I never could make out from the record which it was, of being able to come back at the same time Barry did. So Barry either volunteered to take one of his two remaining missions or volunteered for a mission after he'd completed his during those last few days. And evidently sat down on September 22nd, 1969 to rescue some fellow soldiers and it turned out to be an ambush and Barry's helicopter was lost. And then thinking about Barry, you know, he never knew what the internet was, he never had a cell phone, he never messed with or even dreamed probably about a PC computer, things that all of us who are 50 years later and many from looking around were veterans of the Vietnam era, if not Vietnam itself. Barry never had a wife, never completed his college on the VA bill like I did, never had two wonderful children, and he doesn't have grandchildren, which I'll go home to today. He gave his life for his country about 50 years ago. Now, I salute you, Barry Alexander. Thank you for inviting me.
Thank you, Mr. Eflin. That was wonderful. Uh, Tommy and I didn't have to go to war, but uh, our next speaker did. Alex Fabian. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me here again. Apparently, the one year I don't show up, my dad wants to fall out. <laughs> so Veterans Day, formerly known as Armistice Day, and also Remembrance, uh, and informally known as Poppy Day. I, we have a lot of people out here from the Commonwealth states, and those are the people that celebrate Veterans Day. Veterans Day itself, or the war was never even over, it wasn't over until 10 January 1920. And it was the signing of the peace treaty at the Paris Conference. Now, the whole entire poppy thing I bring up is because I was going through and everybody knows I like poetry. First year I did it, it was about the family members that we leave behind as veterans. This year is going to tie in a little bit more into our veteran spirit and our veteran soul. Lieutenant Colonel John McCrae, May 3rd, 1915, in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow, between the cross, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly. Scars heard amid the guns below, we are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt down, Saw sunset glow, loved, and we were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep through poppies grow in Flanders Fields. Now, the passing of the torch is the passing of the torch that veterans pass on to those who we leave behind. Being a veteran is one of the most selfish, selfless things you could ever do in your entire life. Selfish because the people around you are going to miss you and mourn you when you're gone. And selfless is because that's what we're fighting for. That's what we do it for. You don't just be a veteran overnight. It's something that's earned and instilled into each and every one of us. No matter what service branch or anywhere that you attend, United States military or any other military across this world. And it's something that sticks with us forever. For the past few years now, it's been coming on the TV a little bit more. There's an epidemic called the 22. Now veterans are a proud group of people. No matter what you say. And their experience is only described by how they want to explain it. I can't tell you what any other veteran wants to talk about or how they felt about their service. However, I can tell you, everybody out here, we are brothers and sisters. We are all veterans together no matter what branch, service, or country. And with that being said, it is our responsibility to look out for one another just like we did when we served. If you have a friend, a fellow veteran that you haven't heard from, talked to, seen, call them, say hi, just to see how they're doing. So that way we can prevent ourselves from damaging ourselves. Because we're not gonna reach out for help, we're not gonna ask for somebody to cry on our, for us to cry on their shoulder. We take it upon ourselves to fix the problem, and if we see ourselves as the problem, that's what we do. And it's wrong. There is help, we are still a brotherhood, we are still family, we all still need each other. No matter how much we want to say it, amend it, or deny it. So on this Veterans Day, I urge everybody here to call up a buddy they haven't talked to in 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. If you have an uncle, an aunt, a nephew, a niece, a son, a daughter, a parent that is a veteran, call them. No matter if you've talked to them, you haven't talked to them for whatever reason, and just say Happy Veterans Day. I will tell you right now, I have an estranged brother that lives in Minnesota and I haven't talked to since my mother died. He still texts me on Veterans Day to wish me a happy Veterans Day. No matter what, he still does that. 
We love each other and we have to stick with each other. We have to stop this epidemic from continuing because it's not just the young kids that are coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Vietnam, World War II. We still have all these wars that we've been through and conflicts across the way. So make sure that you reach out and talk to your buddy, talk to your fellow veteran, talk to your family, and let them know that you still care. And God bless everyone and happy Veterans Day. Thank you, Alex. That was quite moving. Um, what he's talking about, if anyone would like to Google something, uh, look up the Silent War Foundation. Now, we have a, an addition to our program this year. Uh, some of you have heard about it. Many of you probably haven't, called the Quilts of Valor, which these two ladies, Susan, Phyllis, come on. They started in here last year, the Carefree Country Club chapter of the Quilts of Valor, and there's going to be 15 quilts awarded today to veterans. Thank you, everyone. I'm Susan Scuda, and I've been a member of Quilts of Valor for a number of years. Usually when I come to Florida, we have one day a year in February where, that we call the National Quilt of Valor Sew Day. Last year, since I knew a lot of people in Carefree who sew, I just extended the invitation, would anyone like to come sew with me on Quilts of Valor National Sew Day? Most people didn't even know what Quilts of Valor was. But I was joined by 14 or 15 members of Carefree, women, and there have been men too, um, who have helped joined us in, um, in creating Quilts of Valor. We had 14 people show up that day in a space of three hours. We made enough blocks for eight quilts. I went back to my Quilts of Valor um, group in North Carolina whose fabric it was that I brought with me and I said, these quilts were made with love by people here in Carefree. I would like to award them to veterans here in Carefree. And they said, Susan, do it. Go ahead, fine. So they were behind me 100% of the way. What Quilts of Valor is, is it started, there was a Blue Star mother in Dover, Delaware in 2002 whose son was deployed to Iraq. She was, she told us that she was, every time the phone rang or the doorbell rang, she was 30 seconds away from full-blown panic. She had a dream one night, wouldn't it be nice if these veterans came home to a quilt, a comforting and healing quilt of valor. And that's how it started. Now there are over 10,000 members in the United States and it has grown. There is Quilts of Valor Canada, the United Kingdom, and Australia and it is still growing and to, to date in the United States alone we have awarded over 230,000 comforting and healing quilts of valor to our veterans and uh, we are proud to do that here today at Carefree. Thank you. I told them I loved a microphone. What I forgot to tell you was, it, in addition to their quilt, which is registered, numbered, it is a once-in-a-lifetime award and considered the highest award a civilian can give to a veteran, they will be receiving a certificate that reads, the Quilts of Valor Foundation wishes to recognize you for your service to our nation. We consider it a privilege to honor you, though we may never know the extent of your sacrifice and service to protect and defend the United States, the United Kingdom, or Canada. And this is an expression of gratitude. We award you this quilt of valor. And Lauren will call the names and we will present the quilts. Alfred L. Peach.
Canadian Forces.
we need to place the reset, uh, I skipped that. Sorry, Mike Cox and Dave Clark. Fall out. <laughs> I made it. I made it. We'll get better at this. Mike and Dave, place the wreaths, please. VFW Honor Guard, you're up to bat. program yet. <laughs> those who have served and those currently serving in the armed services of the United States and Canada are ever mindful that the sweetness of enduring peace has always been tainted by the bitterness of personal sacrifice. We are compelled to never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures, there are others who have endured and may still be enduring the agonies of pain and imprisonment. Before we begin our activities, we pause to recognize our POWs and MIAs. Um, Mike Cox, U.S. Navy. The prisoner of war and missing in action flag has been placed there, symbolizing the members of the professional arms that are absent in our midst. This table set for one is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his oppressors. Len Adams. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. Hal Doton. The single rose displayed in a vase signifies the blood they may have shed in, in sacrifices to ensure our freedom 
of our beloved United States of America and Canada. This rose also reminds us of the families and loved ones of our missing comrades who keep the faith awaiting their safe return. Walt Shattuck. The red ribbon tied prominently on the vase is reminiscent of the red ribbon worn on la the lapel and breast of thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand a proper accounting of our missing. Tom Zander. Oh. A slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. Mike Nudy. There is salt upon the bread plate, symbolic of the country's fallen tears of families as they wait. Marty Drew. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us today. Doug Zaylor. The tear is empty. They are not here. Sutliff. The candle is reminiscent of light of hope, which lives in our hearts to illuminate their way home, away from their captors, to open arms of grateful nation. Bob Westfall. The American and Canadian flags remind us that many of them may never return and have paid the supreme sacrifice to ensure our freedom. Jeff, Jeff Christ, let us remember and never forget their sacrifice. May God forever watch over them and protect them and their families. Remember. <coughs> Fall out. And the honor guard is going to pick up all those casings and give them to me and any of you veterans who got a quilt today. If you'd like a casing, come and get one. Thank you very much. this year, folks. <laughs>